The issue that I really want to speak to isn't just about policy. It's actually about Australians' lives and the potential that we have in this place to save up to 20,000 Australian lives each and every year. This is a matter of public health, and it's one that Australia is lagging behind when it comes to international best practice. So I just wanted to have a discussion today about one global best practice uh, situation that's occurring in Sweden. So this Scandinavian country with a population of just over 10 million is currently on the cusp of achieving an extraordinary feat. It is about to become the first nation to effectively eradicate smoking. This nation stands on the cusp of achieving what we in Australia can only dream of at present, becoming the first smoke-free nation. So how did they do this? WHO uh, considers a country smoke-free when fewer than 5 per cent of the population smoke tobacco. And as of November 2022, the Swedish authorities reported a smoking rate of just 5.6 among those aged over 16 years. So this is a benchmark that we in Australia have aimed to achieve by 2030, yet Sweden is set to meet this year. So how have they done it? The answer is both straightforward and damning of the approach taken by the Australian government. Sweden has made less harmful alternatives to cigarettes accessible, affordable and socially acceptable. Products such as snus, oral nicotine pouches and vaping products were introduced and embraced, leading to a health revolution. In just 14 years, from 2006 to 2020, these alternatives contributed to a striking 60 per cent decrease in Swedish smoking rates. And in stark contrast to that, we find ourselves grappling with the failures of the Australian government's outdated tobacco control framework. Despite world-leading measures such as the highest cigarette prices globally and plain packaging, data from the Council, Council, Cancer Council Victoria shows that there's been no significant decline in adult smoking after, over the past five years. This isn't progress. This is a damning indictment of the Australian government's misguided approach. And I will acknowledge you won't actually hear that very often in this place, but I'll acknowledge that uh, Minister Hunt's prescription model is fa has failed. It is a failed policy. It doesn't work. All it has done is fuel the black market. And after more than a year in office, Labor's response to this is, of course, to not only embrace that policy, but have doubled down on it. They have actually made it more difficult and will punish some of the most vulnerable Australians. So instead of observing and understanding and adopting successful strategies and lessons from Sweden's progress, the health minister persists in an approach of prohibition, banning the very products that have driven down smoking rates in Sweden. So let's examine what's occurred since the health minister's chest-beating exercise last month when he repeatedly stated he was determined to take strong action on vaping. So in the May budget, there was no funding allocated to enforce this misguided vape prohibition plan. This critical oversight is indicative of a government that's willing to make grand media statements but lacks any commitment to see them through. Further, the head of Border Force has publicly stated that banning vapes at the border won't be enough to stamp out a rampant black market, as his organisation was already only managing to detect a quarter of illicit drugs making their way to Australia. So let's have a think about it. Do we want Border Force focused on stopping heroin, cocaine, guns coming into Australia, or do we want them focused on blueberry vapes? Furthermore, state governments have voiced their concerns about the practicality and costs of enforcing this ban. In fact, Labor Premier, New South Wales Premier Chris Minns, has conceded the vape ban will be difficult to enforce and has indicated his government would seek support from the Commonwealth. The Labor Victorian Premier has said he's concerned that the Commonwealth Government would push costs on to the states. The Police Federation of Australia CEO has publicly stated officers are already under-resourced at a state and territory level, meaning resources to enforce vape bans will likely be redirected from other critical policing efforts such as domestic violence, organised crime, firearm offences. So these concerns paint a pretty bleak picture of the Labor Government's ill-conceived policy. And it's not just the prescription-only model that's failing Australia. It's a policy 
that lacks any planning, adequate funding and a reasonable understanding of its enforceability. So where does this leave us? It leaves it at the mercy of the Albanese government's failed approach, a government that, despite evidence to the contrary, is doubling down on a policy that's proven unsuccessful, a government that is choosing to ignore the success of nations like Sweden, where a different approach has delivered remarkable results. Now, I know those opposite and those that seem to have vaping as their raison d'etre for screaming that they're going to accuse me and others who support the legal right of adults to ingest nicotine in any which way they choose, whether it is a cigarette, a legal product, a spray, a patch, a gum, an inhaler, that there is no reason vapes should not be considered the same as a consumer product. But what has happened under this failed prescription model is a black market has flourished. We want to talk about organised crime. That's where the vapes are coming from at the moment. They are imported from China. They're not stopped at the border. And even if they are stopped, there's sort of a fine. There's no jail term. So it's actually safer for them to in, in, uh, move their business model to vapes than it is to drugs or gums in some ways anymore, because there's no jail time associated with it. It's actually forcing small business owners and manufacturers in Australia who produce uh, liquid juice that is used in vaping without the nicotine. It is putting pressure on those businesses that they will be unable to survive. So what happens when legal entities are pushed out of the market through failed policy? What that means is the black market continues to grow. And we know that they are panicking over those opposite about the reduction in cigarette excise that they are currently able to access. And that's because cigarette rates are dropping, because vaping is an incredibly successful smoking cessation tool. In fact, to the point that over in the UK, they are offering financial incentives to pregnant women to stop smoking and go to e-cigarettes or vapes. They are actually providing them at the hospitals. New Zealand is streets ahead of us when it comes to decline in smoking rates because they have embraced vaping as a smoking cessation tool. They also have significantly lower rates of youth vaping because it is regulated correctly. So rather than the government looking at what is a failed policy, and I've already said I'll accept responsibility that Minister Hunt put it in, Matt Canavan, Senator Canavan and I in particular argued very strongly against it. You can look at our recommendations from the report. What we want to see is a regulated and licensed market. We want to make sure that there's quality control. We don't want people being able to axe their Wuhan sticks where you don't know where anything's being produced, you don't know what's in it, there's no nicotine levels. We want a product that has a quality control. We want a product that Australians can be sure of its safety and its efficacy. But we want to see that it's sold as a consumer product, 